Jackie Porter. Oh my gosh. I am so excited to welcome you to Power Presence Position. Woohoo! Happy to be here, girl. Yay. I can't awesome. believe it's been this long that we made this interview happen. This is such an important conversation and I'm so glad that we are having it. And I am so glad that I'm having it with you. Y'all need to go check out Jackie Porter. It's askjackie.ca. We will send you all the details after, but you really need to go and learn from Jackie and talk to Jackie. I don't think I've ever met someone who just makes money as practical and easy as you do. It's a gift. It's a gift and just accessible. Like you make wealth accessible. But before we dive in, we were talking about something before I hit record. And I heard you argue that it's more expensive to be a woman. Say more about that. Yeah. Well, there's so many additional costs we pay as women that we just kind of take for granted because it's kind of baked in, right? So we pay more for haircuts. We pay more for shavers. Like seriously, what's the difference between a male shaver and a a female shaver? Like nothing, literally nothing. We, I call all of these products that we pay extra for because we're a woman, the female tax, right? It's the additional female tax we pay. We also, you know, live longer. So it costs us more. We do way more of the caregiving, especially in the pandemic. Goodness, this is blaring how much more caregiving we're doing. And we do it all while making 81 cents on the dollar for every dollar (laughs) a guy makes. Just saying, just saying. That doesn't even compare to the cost, the intangible cost of just being in a woman living in in a patriarchal society. I call that patriarchal judgment, which really impacts our confidence every single day, even uh, it even impacts how we see other women because okay. we see it through so, the lens of patriarchal gender. Exactly. And this is huge. So let's talk about for a moment. I mean, I completely understand this idea of patriarchal judgment. And guys, I think when we're talking about patriarchal judgment, we're not talking about men judging us necessarily. I think we're talking mm-hmm. about growing up in a culture that has where men have written the rules and they and a lot of what success looks like has been written through that lens and now here we are making money as women entrepreneurs negotiating higher rates holding our value and the implications for doing that are so much different for women than for men but i'd love for you to share an example of maybe how of what patriarchal judgment looks like like how it might hold a woman back in her oh totally yeah. Totally. It's kind of like I say to um, the world, like I, I think about calling myself a financial confident, confidant, which I do. And it's like, who do you think you are, right, to call yourself a financial confidant? And it, it's funny because we're talking about patriarchal judgment. And I remember uh, somebody who wanted me to use their services started this male, and I'm not picking on anyone male in particular, but this is common, right? He comes to my comes to me and sends me a message on Messenger saying, um, so what gives you the right to call yourself a confidant? Which is kind of the thing that happens with women every day when we listen to that little voice in our mind where we see this lens of patriarchal judgment through everything. So we judge ourselves probably the most harshly because of patriarchal judgment. We judge ourselves, we judge other women through this lens of seeing everything through a man's eyes. So this man saying to me, who do I think I am is kind of like this question that women entrepreneurs particularly contend with because it's like who do I think I am to be a seven-figure business owner right like should I even do that maybe I shouldn't maybe I'm not good enough to do that and this really this takes a toll on our psyche every single day that we make a decision to do anything well and this is so interesting like I remember early in my entrepreneurial career so this was in my first business I'm in my 20s and this really powerful executive come. So I'd written an article on this CEO and I owned the copyright and that's how you make money. Well, a lot of writers did not make money this way. I sure did. I took that copyright very seriously. So they come and they say, can we reprint this article on our website? And I was like, you can, and it's going to be a thousand dollars. And he was offended He called that jerk called my publisher. And this was a respectful conversation, you know, and he's saying to me, do you know how good this is going to be for your career? And I said to him, do you know how good this is going to be for your CEO's career? 
to have this amazing article about him on your website. Anyway, so he calls my publisher and tries to get the publisher to fire me as a contractor for this. Anyway, the magazine, God love them, stood up, had no, and this company meanwhile was a big advertiser. But I can remember that Jackie so much. I didn't realize it at the time, but I remember standing up for myself, but I was young, I was naive, I felt awful. And it took me a long time to be able to charge like that again and to stand up for myself again. It was months. That's patriarchal judgment, right? That's, that's what I'm talking about. Is that who do you think you are that women question themselves with every day? And it really takes, and, and that intangible cost takes a toll on our mental health. It takes a toll on us being feeling comfortable advocating for ourselves the way you did. Right. And so it takes a village. It takes men supporting us. It takes other women reminding ourselves that we shouldn't be so harsh to judge ourselves so harshly and to judge consequently other women harshly as well. We can be a lot kinder to ourselves and we certainly can give ourselves agency to stand up for ourselves, especially and, and most importantly to me to, around finance, because there's so much at stake. Yeah. Give an example of how maybe it, we can be hard on other women through like fight and how that impacts women generating money. Cause I'm curious about that as well. Yeah. Well, even making a bold, um, making a bold um, commitment to ourselves, like out loud. So we make a declaration. We want to be a seven figure business owner. And, you know, I think some of the things we've talked about, because I've been in, in your community, in the um, Eleanor Beaton community of women, and I, I remember so many times women said, we, I can't have these conversations with my friends, with my family, God love them. But yeah. sometimes it's a corrosive environment to talk about not playing small anymore and having these, you know, ambitious goals that we want to set for ourselves. That could be what's holding us to being, you know, consultant versus mm -hmm. taking our business to the next level, incubating it, you know, scaling our business. That yeah. could be some of the things holding us back. Oh, that's so good. I remember Oprah, who would have known this better than anybody as a self-made billionaire. I remember her saying, people will support you until you exceed their expectations of you. And right. And I think that's kind of what you're talking about. It's this. And I think also, you know, as women, we've been shut out of wealth for that's so right. long, you know? And so when you are part of the, when you're part of the population that hasn't had it can become in a patriarchal system, it can be ingrained that there's only so few who can be at this table. So I love totally. this message, you know, no, actually that's not true. No, <laughs> totally. It's, it's so funny, Eleanor, just recently, um, I was applying for additional credit to fuel my business and I'm talking to this male banker and we're going through my assets. It's so funny because every time I mention I own a, you know, another property or another asset, he's like, oh, good for you. Good for you. Oh my gosh, you're like, what, why don't you call me little girl next? I know, like pat me on the head. I'm like, seriously. So this is, this is the lens of everything that we have to like navigate through. So it's even yeah. a wonder all the, yeah. all the strides women have made in the last hundred years. So I want to talk about where this passion for really advancing the economic standing of women, you know, helping us stand in our financial power, because from the moment I met you, I met you just after you had written the book, single by single by chance or choice. Single by choice or chance. Single, single by, choice by choice or, or chance. chance. And I was like, agency, always. girl, that was an amazing to book title. Um, but, you know, that passion for really empowering women, it was there. When you look back to like growing up, I know, you know, the, your sort of growing up formative years, what was it that re where this, that really gave rise to this passion for the economic empowerment of women? So it's having a really strong mom. <laughs> it's a mom who basically, you know, from the time I was like seven years old, was always saying to me, because she was a single mom and an immigrant saying, you know, always rely on yourself, have your own, never rely on a man. And, you know, she unfortunately passed and left this world way too early. She passed away when I was 16 and I became suddenly single. 
And, you know, what happened to me was I had to make a lot of adult decisions around finances, but having the kind of mom who worked three jobs, who enlisted you to do all the jobs she was doing, because, you know, babysitting and child labor laws aren't what they are today. It's true. It's true. They were like more of a suggestion when we were growing up. (laughs) A very strong suggestion. Like I knew there was no choice. So all of those things have created the resiliency that I have. So I kind of find, think of my past, my past as a blessing and a curse at the same time, because it really helped to build my confidence. So here I am, like by the, from the time I was 13, I was always working a couple of jobs. And by the time I was 16, I was probably working three jobs while going to school, trying to figure out how to keep a roof over my head and food on the table, living with roommates. And the funny thing that came out of that is, strangely enough, people saw me living on my own at, you know, 17, 16, whatever, and thought they could come to me for advice. Like I knew something. Really, what my mother taught me was how to survive. So I knew how to do that. It was really many, many years later after learning that because I was been always been in these, you know, precarious financial situations growing up, I became a really good saver. I know how to, I know how to budget like nobody, right? Like I can make a dollar out of 15 cents. So all of this to say that when I got my first full-time job and got, you know, saved as much as I could, took advantage of all the programs that they had, and then consequently got let go from my first, they they downsized the the company. Um, I found and came across my first female planner because I was referred to her and she told me money could work for me. This was 10 years after, you know, working three jobs. I was like this, I'm already tired, right? (laughs) Like 10 years of working really, really hard. And so here I am at 25, getting downsized, learning that money could work for me. I'm like, I need to know everything I can about how money can work for me because I'm tired and I don't want to do this for the rest of my life. And you're only 25. (laughs) I know. I think that's so cute. Like I would so love to meet that woman, that 25 year old version of you. And again, I mean, I think just knowing you, you know, that resilience, um, but in its resilience combined with generosity, I can completely see people coming and be like, you must know, ask Jackie, like she, she knows what's up. <laughs> right. That's I mean, that's, that's amazing. It. That's exactly right. So for me, it was, I was just, um, really looking to get financially stable because I had been in such a long period of financial insecurity out of sheer need. I wanted to learn about wealth out of complete sheer need. And then when I actually came out with a book, Eleanor, and started to tell my story in the, to the world, because I really wasn't comfortable. This isn't a story that I felt like I wanted to champion out into the world. But what I came to realize is so many women um, were inspired by it and felt like, again, if you can see it, you can be it, right? So yeah. if I can come from nothing and create my own seven figure net worth, because that's what the financial industry did for me. After learning about wealth, I created my own seven figure net worth. And now I'm, you know, really just so, I feel so grateful that people are inspired by my story and want to figure out how they can do it as well. There's so much that I want to unpack there. This is so interesting because you talked about this idea of building a seven figure net worth. And you talked about being 25 years old, you'd worked so hard, you were tired of working. Now you wanted to make your money work for you. And it's interesting because I really think that there's an issue that we, that starts very young for women that may be changing, but very young where the whole sort of women's liberation movement has been equal opportunity in the workforce. So equal opportunity to make money. We're, we still don't have it because we're still earning, as you said, 81 cents on the dollar. But I think where that hasn't evolved yet and it needs to is equal opportunity to build wealth. That's right. Because they're different things. Like I think as women, we're used to making money through our labor. I don't that's think right. we're used to making money through our assets. That's that, that's that patriarchal judgment that you're talking about. Exactly. Exactly. I mean, here's the thing, like the thing about getting a paycheck and, and this is one of the things I caution women about is you can literally spend your whole life having money get added with income and subtracted with expenses and not really change your circumstances significantly. Where things get interesting from a net worth and wealth building perspective is having your money multiply. Yeah, You can only have your money multiply a few different ways from putting it in investments where it has time to compound and grow. Um, and you know, one of the things I wanted to talk about was a rule of 72. Divide any number by 72 and it'll tell you how long it takes for money to double. So 
easy math, ladies, 7.2, 10% leads 7.2 years for your money to double. So how many of you out there have your money in a savings account where you're earning like almost nothing and time is passing and time can be your friend or your enemy, depending on how you use it. Um, so the more time you have that money can multiply, the more powerful you can more quickly, uh, the, sorry, I should say the more powerful wealth building can be for you because uh, adding and subtracting money and, and taking your paycheck for granted or taking your wealth for granted in that way is really just a, it's really a scenario where you have a limited opportunity to build wealth. The other way you can build wealth from a um, money working for you is having your business create more wealth for you through things like scaling. Right. And I know you talk a lot about scaling. So how can you structure your business in such a way that it actually ends up being more of that cash register you like to talk about, um, Eleanor? So and that might mean you have to put, you know, technology, employ technology um, so that you use it in a way where there is more opportunity to, to make the most leverage the assets in your business that you have. So I, I think these are conversations we're starting to lean into, but so much more conversations around how do we leverage our business to create more of a, a asset, an income stream for us without working harder? Because there's only so much we can, how much, so much, um, you know, power, um, yes. so much labor we can, we can employ in our business. But you know what, to that point, this is so interesting where I found that my wealth started growing because I'm all about helping build a seven figure foundation. Right. No. And then from there, it's about how can we translate that into a seven figure net worth? Because they're not the same thing, ladies, just because you're generating seven figures in revenues. That's an amazing starting point. But can you take that then and translate it into wealth, you know? And so there's so much that I want to unpack here on this topic with you about turning it into wealth and not overworking. You talked about how can you grow and scale your business without over, overworking. To me, one of the biggest things, the place where my personal wealth and my personal financial situation started shifting and seeing more dramatic growth actually happened when I had, as I scaled my business and put the proper systems in place, because now I had time and focus and attention for money as an asset in and of itself. Like I started paying more attention to it, looking at it, watching it, it you know, using it as a tool versus just this thing, like you say, that's coming in, that's like flowing through. <laughs> you know what I mean? A hundred percent. And I love that you said that you spent time with your money. You spend time, look, because a lot of times we don't pay attention. We take our money for granted. Like I said, taking your paycheck or your assets in your business even for granted and having that time. It's kind of like any relationship, right? You yeah. got to spend time with that, right? And I don't think for many women, we, we don't realize it, but whether you realize it or not, you're in a relationship with money, right? Yes. <laughs> Either it's your best friend, it could be your enemy, it could be your friend or foe, your frenemy. You know what I mean? Are you chasing it? Like, please pick me, pick me. You know what I mean? Yes, <laughs> like, so totally. You, you got to decide how we want to, you know, be in a relationship with money. And, and a part of being in a relationship is considering it a positive relationship where you want to spend time with it. You want it to be your friend. Like yeah. I have this mantra, Eleanor, that every day I say to myself, because I want to always be in a positive scenario with money, which is I love money and it loves me. Because if it, you don't love money, it's not going to love you back. Okay. So I love this. Let's just chat a little bit about a couple sort of simple practices that you have um, that really have helped you build that relationship, that positive relationship with money, but also help it grow. So for example, you have, what are things that you maybe do on a weekly basis? And they could be like your mantra. It could be something else. What does, what does Jackie Porter, the queen of money, <laughs> what do you do to really help, you know, um, make the money grow? So, you know, again, quality time with money means making a date an appointment with yourself, at least like I check in, I look at my money once a day to be honest, but if you're not someone looking at your you know, bank accounts once a day to see what's happening, at least do it once a, once a week. Yeah. Um, and then, you know, try to go through 
your like I, I I think there's so many good ways to stay on top of your money. Um, I have a really good relationship as well with my accountant, and I want an accountant. And you should think thoroughly about who is your market. Does your accountant understand your business? Like yeah. you want to have an accountant that truly understands your business, especially now in the pandemic. Like, are they someone who um, can help you get access to loans, grants for your business? So having someone who actually truly understands your business. And again, having that good relationship with money means you can have an accountant who can you can talk to and say, listen, this is something I don't understand. I'm looking at my financial statement. So this is something I practice on a regular basis as well. Once a month, I meet with my accountant, except at tax time, where I go, okay, let's go through my financial statements. Help me understand what's going on. What do I need to focus on? You know, like make sure your accountant, you can talk to them, that you feel comfortable having those uncomfortable conversations about what you understand, what you don't understand. Make sure they're kept in the loop about what your financial plans are. Are you selling a property, buying a property? Will you be needing to apply for more loans in the future? Because all of those things are going to impact how your financial circumstances should show up on paper. You know what? I think this is so, this is so genius because there's a bunch of things that I want to dissect there on that. So number one, I couldn't agree more with the idea of having an accountant that you love and that works for you. And if you don't have one, here's the thing with accounting. It's a pain to switch accountants. It's just a pain. And what I can tell you, we switched accountants three times in four years. And I'm so glad that we did. And every time it was a pain, a huge pain, but to really find the right solution. I love our accounting team. Now um, we do, like you said, we do those. So we're checking in regularly, but we also have monthly meetings with accountants to go through. Right. And it's like, look, this was different from, this is a little higher than it normally would be, or this is what this is. So it's just a great practice. But the other thing, and this is so interesting, we realized, so we just bought a new house, which I love. And the house, because as an entrepreneur, you take as much money as you want. <laughs> you know, That's you right. pay yourself whatever you want. And there's, and one of the things that happened is we started deciding, you know what, in a couple of years, we think that we want to buy a new home. This is our budget that we're thinking about. How much money do we need to pay ourselves? to make that mortgage work. That's right. That's right? exactly and right. And you we had to be prepared That's exactly a few right. years before because you otherwise do. yes, right? So you you have to be in an ongoing conversation with your team. So every yes. every entrepreneur needs a great bookkeeper, a great accountant. If they're shaming and blaming you, get them out of the picture. Oh, a good banker you. that you can act Yeah, because if they're saying, "Oh, you don't need to understand this and this whole patriarchal judgment thing again, right? So they're judging you before and you've already judged yourself. So it's only going to make it that much harder for you to ask the questions you really need to ask. Am I making money? Um, you know, we were talking earlier about, you know, that seven figure income versus the seven figure net worth. I identify people who have seven figure revenue that don't have seven, seven figure net worth as broke millionaires. Oh, that's only, such a good one. You can only, you can earn it, but you're not actually seeing yes. that show up to actually create income for you in the future. So you're still yeah. that person working really, really hard. Yes. But at some point you'll want your assets to work that hard, right? Yes. So let's talk about how that happens, how to become a rich, wealthy millionaire. So we talked off the top about three different ways to really begin building wealth. We talked about investing, leveraging, and multiple streams of income. So let's break it down. Investing, right? So investing, I, I think people are fairly, you know, they're, they're I'm, look, they're aware of the concept, but what are some things that we should be thinking about when it comes to investing and like, and how much should we be investing? Like, I just love to hear your thoughts on that. I, I think um, first and foremost, make a commitment to put money aside for the future, especially not related to your business. Just to, again, when we're talking about multiple streams of income to diversify the streams of income you'll have access to later. Right. So that's always, cause that's like your future income stream. So create another stream of income. So that's the first thing. And then automatically set it up. So it's coming out of your business, just like you're taking money for your home or all the other things that you want to get. 
Um, you also want to make sure you're putting money away that's going to create an income stream, right? So I think I think committing, having that done automatically means you don't have to think about it and you're living on whatever you have left, right? So if you're taking a paycheck from your business and that's what you're living on, you can, you can either do one of two things. You can save inside your corporation. If you have a corporation, if you're self-employed and you're taking money from your business, then that could be, you're, you're, t- you're deciding to say 10% of my money is all, like sometimes people tell me they're putting 20% for taxes, you know, they're, they're living on 40, then maybe 10% for saving and have it come out automatically, no matter what. So you're always getting into that habit of putting money away for yourself. Because if you're not making investing for your future a priority, who's going to? You know what Look, I mean? I couldn't agree more. And that's what we do, um, saving inside the company, um, just because mm-hmm. it makes a lot more sense for us from tax perspective and all of that. But that whole practice of it's gone, like That's that right. money is, it doesn't exist anymore. And That's I right. have found that. And it's amazing because as the company starts growing and you start putting away more and more, it's fun to be able to watch this accumulation grow that can then be redirected to, to create even more all the things. Yes. So, so love. I, I love that. And that's why I like a percentage versus a dollar amount, because then that's always growing based on what you're making. Yeah. And, you know, going back to, and this is, again, where an accountant comes in, should I be saving inside my corporation or outside? Like, yes. these are these conversations. And, and that's why, you know, if even if it's painful to change accountants, finding an accountant who I call an advisor yes. versus a filer is yes. really Yes. Thank you. Because they're totally different. Like, totally. There can be accountants who specialize in high net worth. And look, Honestly, most high net worth people are entrepreneurs. <laughs> so ladies, right. we're lucky, you know? And so it's like really that accountant is different than your month to month filing, you know, regular business type, you know, compliance um, book, uh, you know, a- accountant as well. So I think, I think one of the things that's coming through for me based on this conversation is this idea that we build our seven figure businesses and we have a team helping that business grow. If you want your nest egg to grow, it's really smart to have a team there too. (laughs) hundred percent. And taxes are a big eat from your wealth, right? So having someone who can advise you before you set up an investment, you know, how to structure things means that you actually are keeping more of that money that you've worked so hard to get. Yeah, exactly. So there's investing, which I love. Um, And here's a question for you as you've, uh, this is, and I hope this doesn't put you on the spot. You don't have to answer if you don't want to, but for you, what percentage did you put away? Like what percentage did you put away? You know, like when you, as you, as you were building your business and growing your business, how did you, what did you decide to do? It's, it's actually a crazy amount of money that I save. So you have to make sure you understand that. Oh my God. She's extra. You guys, I love it. I love it. No, no, I'm just saying, because listen, since I was, I'm really good at living on very little. And I also try to figure out a way for my, for the assets I have to make me money. Right. So that, so, you know, like I'm the kind of person, just so you have an understanding of how my mind works is um, where, where you see me living right now is one of my properties and it's a triplex and I live on, you know, the main floor, we're actually just building out the basement because of the pandemic. But our plan initially was we were renting this space that we were living on the second floor, which was the biggest floor, but we were going to rent this out. And I'm like, oh, I want to travel five times a year. How can I afford to do that without using my own money? Well, we'll rent this out as an Airbnb, use it to pay for our travel costs. That was, that's how, just how my mind works. Oh my gosh. I love it. I love that's, it. So that's much. How, like, so I'm like, how can I get someone to help me pay? And then I just like in my life, I manifest that as much as I can. It's like, yeah. Hmm, I want to, like, I, I love writing. Mm-hmm. And so I'm like, how, who can pay me to write? How can I manifest someone paying me to write stuff I wanted to write about anyway? So it's mm-hmm. just, I'm just like, the average millionaire has seven streams of income and it could be a book like, like I wrote the book. That's another stream of income. So I'm just always thinking about like, especially now that I really, the concept is very much embedded into my psyche, but I want all entrepreneurs out there to think, okay, if I'm in a business where I do X, so, you know, I I'm in the, the business of like just to basic hairstyling, 
mm-hmm. then maybe on the side, so- something I can offer in my salon is beauty products mm-hmm. that, you know, so that's another potential stream of income. Or, you know, I, I know a number of makeup artists who um, they get hired as an influencer. So they're making another stream of income from being an influencer. So it's just kind of like, how can I think a little bit outside of the box to create more income from me inside for my business? And then also creating investments that will create future income for me. So I, I save like probably about 40% of my income. I love it. I love it. Because I just, because I've also always never had anybody to rely on except me, except I have my partner now. If he's listening, he'll kill me if I say it. I know. Right. He's like, wait, what am I? Chopped liver. Exactly. To your point, because my mom said the same thing. My mom said to me, you know, cause she was totally financially dependent on my dad. And so sometimes they would have disagreements about how money should be spent. And it was a lot harder for her because she, and this is a dynamic that happens, right? It's a real dynamic, um, inside partner relationships that if one person is making all the money, even if they're like, it's 50, 50, it doesn't always feel that way. You know, and so I can remember her saying to me, Eleanor, money is power. Always make your own. So I wouldn't let people pay for dates. Like I was just like, I had a very hard time with that. I just felt like weird. Yeah. Right. And so it actually took me a while to really be able to lean on my life partner, Leon. Right. And I just, I'm starting to be able to do that, but I didn't, I, I was like, I didn't think that way, even though our, we pulled our money all the time, but it, I felt like it was very hard for me to have that trust. No, I, I completely agree. And my partner every day, like, you know, my story, right? I write a book called single by choice or chance and start promoting it only to meet my, the love of my life and, you know, start promoting the book. Um, living. I feel like single by choice or chance for (laughs) y'all, not for me. (laughs) So all all of this to say, you know, I had to start to get really comfortable um, just really talking about money in a different way. And and one of the things that I've discovered through, you know, being in a relationship, talking about money is it's really helpful to have third-party advice when it comes to being in a relationship, talking about money and super, super important for women to be really comfortable having money conversations. <laughs> I just did, I just did actually a, a theme last month for Valentine's day. Cause you know, I always do the opposite of what everybody else is doing. <laughs> oh, are you financially undateable? Right. And really being financially undateable, what that's all about is people, um, there was a survey that came out last year that said 80% of people, if they found out they, when you were dating that you were in debt, they would like run, they ditch. Oh, so so yes. what that says, like what to me, the harbinger of that is we have to get better at talking about these things as a, a woman. We have to get better talking to in our relationships about money. Um, we can't wait because I think sometimes when we don't feel good about our circumstances, we don't talk about it. We might be waiting for someone else to save us from ourselves. That's and right. just this whole empowerment thing that your mother talked about and not and feeling diminished in a relationship because financially you weren't in the same place. You and I both know over the course of a lifetime, financial circumstances can change. Maybe you started off, your husband started off as a breadwinner, you're now you are, or vice versa. And so being comfortable and confident, having conversations about money is crucial. And, and it's even more important for women because we're getting married later, we're having kids later, and we have so much more to lose because we live longer when things don't work out. So it's truthfully to me helpful um, in my role as a financial planner. And what I found even just having these conversations in my own relationship is it's helpful to have a third party like a neutral third party, like a financial planner, talk to you, talk you through these conversations because it's less like confrontational, right? Mm -hmm. So I I often say to my clients that I think sometimes you guys having a conversation with me because I I feel like I'm the referee that can talk through things that challenges they're having as a couple and bring it back to, here are some practical things we can do to have this conversation. It's actually easier than going to talk to a therapist. You yes, know what I mean? yes. So it's talking about money with an advisor, whoever your advisor is, and if you have advisors you're working with, you know, think through talking to your, you know, advisor about your conversations or conflicts when it comes to money, because I think it's a lot easier. It, we can actually give practical advice, practical yeah. solutions to how you can deal with it that doesn't shame or blame anybody. Yeah. And that moves the relationship forward. 
Well, and it's so interesting because I think sometimes, you know, the heart of what these life partnerships about are about co-creating together a prosperous future. You know, that's that's a huge part of it. There's, and, and prosperity means so many different things, but it's interesting that ability to learn how to talk about it, to learn how to look at it together, to learn how to grow together in that way, that has been huge, you know, for us. And I do think that that ability to have an advisor or somebody, you know, who can be in there with you is, I mean, that's, that's huge. That's huge. No, absolutely. And even to advocate for yourself, because you were saying before with your mother who, you know, maybe your dad was on a different financial footing than her, just being able to, you know, talk through the financial decisions of the household with someone who isn't taking anyone's side, but saying, maybe these are some different ways we can work through whatever your goals, whatever your mother's goals would be. So but whatever each of you have as goals, and then what do you, what are you guys doing together? So I I often say to couples, you, me, and we goals. Yes, like these are the totally. goals we have. And, you know, we could be coming from different relationships. Like the women I deal with who are over 45 might be in a second marriage. And so yeah. having you, me and we goals are realistic. You can have separate bank accounts and still work together on we goals. You know what I mean? And I think yeah. these are the kinds of ways we have to start learning how to have the conversation, which means we have to become more familiar with financial literacy uh, as 100%. well. 100%. Well, you know what else I think we need to be familiar with, which I have, which I I think is um, also important is not just making money, but having it. So you talked about how you, you save like 40% of the money that you have, which I think is amazing. And it's so interesting. I can remember reading this book called the millionaire next door. It is yes, I love that book. best book I've ever read about money. Yes. It's fascinating guys. Just go out, read that book. And I, and it shifted everything, you know, in terms of, I read it a long time ago and basically it was all about just stop trying to look rich, <laughs> you know what I mean? like, which isn't to say you can't get nice things and all of that. But I remember reading that and it impacted staying in the same house for a long time, it impacted the cars that we bought. It impacted a lot of different things and it allowed, and it became um, uh, just a way of being. And initially it was um, it was more of a necessity to be like exactly. that. Right? Exactly, I mean, that's what I was gonna say. As you know, I came from nothing. And yeah. I, you know, for a long time, I, I remember people making fun of my family in particular, yeah. my secondhand clothes. Who yeah. knew that these year, many years later, secondhand would be so fashionable. Right. right? And, and now like people are all like fighting with me at the secondhand store to get things on sale at the secondhand store. Cause I still shop that way. I still love stuff. <laughs> she's and, like, like Jackie's like, you know, she's like, I'm a millionaire and I'm still going to shop there. Well, you're doing <laughs> the things that made you a millionaire. <laughs> And staying a millionaire. So I just find it interesting because the whole term broke millionaire has a lot to do with the mindset piece, right? So a lot of times, instead of actually leveraging money, so um, this whole idea of um, leveraging is borrowing um, to build wealth right? But often we're borrowing to buy depreciating assets. So to me, like to borrow and spend your time buying the shiny new car that as soon as you drive it off a lot, comes down in value, buying it for, you know, TV, furniture, nothing wrong with that. But what if we actually borrowed to build wealth, like buy a property or buy investments? That's a game changer. And, you know, like really what you want to do is do as much as you can to protect your credit. That's the other piece I would say is protect your credit. Lots of people, when I, even when I did this event this morning for Startup Canada, told me they didn't know what their credit score was. You oh. need to know your credit score because it's yeah. your financial reputation and it allows you to access OPM, other people's money. Yes, right? And yes. other people's money, it, you want to use it to, as I said, build wealth, not to just get bad debt, like not get assets that are depreciating. Well, and you know, to that point, that idea of, of can you have money or do you need to get rid of it all the time? You know, do you need to mm. let it, do you need to release it on this and release it on some clothes and release it on a new car and, and release it on, I think there's something powerful about just that ability to like, just have it, you know, and, and that is um, for me, I know 
that was something that I really wanted to make sure that I knew how to have it. Um, and that, that to, to real, because it was the, it was the millionaire next door thing that sunk into my head so much that most people don't actually know how to have it. And in today, a lot of times there's like this whole sort of abundance mindset. All I am all about money mindset, but I'm also like, I'm not going to listen to broke money mindset people. You know what I mean? <laughs> you can say all the stuff you can be like, I'm going to upgrade and surround myself in luxury. I'm like, and you're still broke. Yeah. So how about we actually focus on building wealth? Because the biggest luxury in my mind is to have a cash reserve, have investments that can produce, right? Yeah, that emergency fund. And didn't we learn in 2020 how important having that reserve is for business owners, right? Like, you know, no shame if you didn't and you still have time to build it, but build that reserve because they, every every time you have that much more money working for you gives you that freedom to have that your future self be able to have that actual um, ability to stop working. Mm -hmm. So the, 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 the more you have money working for you, the more the sooner the more money you have working for you, the sooner you can actually stop working. Yes. So oh my God. What's your number? What do you actually need to live? Like, I don't actually need that much to live to tell you the truth. But having said that, you know, the more years I can buy myself in the future where I can stop working, that's really how you, that's how millionaires define themselves. They're like, yeah. okay, I'm three times a millionaire based on having, you know, this many more years that I don't have to work if, if I want to. Yeah. And, and to me, talking about, you know, how to define wealth, it's that time freedom, right? Because that's the yeah. one thing you can't get back yes. is time. Yes. So if you can have your, if you can have money, create this, this treasure chest of income that, you know, okay. Uh, and this is a conversation I have with entrepreneurs all the time, because they're like, I'm going to work until I die. Well, that's lovely. But maybe you might want to retire your assets at some point yeah. and have the choice that if in case you don't want to work till you die, you can stop working and know now I have these assets that are going to work for me. Yes. Oh, such an important conversation. And there's so many play. I mean, I could talk to you all day. And um, I mean, honestly, my goal in this conversation was really to inspire women entrepreneurs to think about not just making sales, but building wealth. I can say from my personal experience that the more I'm thoughtful, the more I'm strategic, the more I just kind of slow it down a little bit and get my, make sure I'm in situations where I don't feel pressure, the more I'm able to make my money work for me. And the more conversations I can have like this with women like you who really understand how money works, have, you know, you clearly have a great relationship with money and you have used money to make you very rich. <laughs> you know what I mean? And so that's really fun. Like, let's just say it, you know? And I think, so I, I really want to be able to highlight your wisdom and insight because I think you're a wonderful role model and example for women to say, look, it's accessible. It's available to you. It doesn't have to be that complicated. You don't have to feel ashamed about it. You know, you hear, this is a safe space for you to talk about building. I, I, absolutely. And I, I was just going to say, I don't, it's, please understand. I don't feel like I'm special, right? I don't think like I'm some unicorn understanding how money works. I've just been doing it a really long time, right? So there's, there is such a thing as a 10,000 hours. And that's why I'm really encouraging all of the women that you talk to, to just lean into more financial literacy, like decide this is a year you're going to learn a little bit more about wealth, like decide there's one thing you want to learn about building wealth and just start like leading into that, like yeah. lead a little bit more. You don't have to learn everything, but just decide even one thing and then yeah. decide where you need help as well. Yes. And, and listen to people like, again, building that financial team, you know, yes. and getting educated about who needs to be on that team. I think we really shared some cool things here for people about the types of people that, you know, you want to have surrounding you, you know, to help you, um, to help you build that wealth. I wanted to take a moment, you know, so we've talked a lot here about building wealth and, 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 you know, um, investing and multiple streams of income and all that. I wanted to take a moment to talk a little bit about your path as an entrepreneur, because I used to joke, I used to call um, Jackie the media sensation, <laughs> because Jackie, you guys will see, like, 
you know, you have really grown a tremendous business that has, that has cash influence and autonomy, which are my three measures of success is the business generating cash. You know, is it profitable? Are you, are you influenced? Are you impacting your industry and really making a difference in the lives of the people you serve check? And do you have autonomy? You know, and I think that's where that ability, like, can you step away? Can you, do you have to keep working in the business and you have that autonomy and, and just sort of watching that development as an entrepreneur has been so impressive, you know, um, just been so impressive. So go check Jackie out. Jackie, you were a member of the incubator for three years in this community. And I wanted you to, I was hoping you could really speak to the power of community because so many of us as entrepreneurs, we're kind of lone wolves, you know, yeah. And, yeah. and you were already successful, right? And so I sometimes think even people who like successful, like, oh, a group isn't going to help me. You know what I mean? I, but I wondered if you could kind of speak to the impact of the incubator, especially the community, you know, for you and what role, how it supported the growth. Yeah, I, I think, um, you know, we were talking a little bit about this before, but sometimes um, that lone wolf, being a lone wolf in, in business, because there's still not that many women, you know, who have, are occupying seats at the table, right? So yeah. it can be really lonely to be an entrepreneur. It's, it's specifically lonely being a female entrepreneur, especially a female entrepreneur of color in the financial industry. Yes. So having, having access to women who, um, you know, can share what it's like with their own business, I can hear their stories, their journey, the mistakes they've made, the successes they've had. Like, it's so powerful because sometimes as an entrepreneur, the loneliness is, is also not knowing what you don't know yeah. and not, not knowing what questions you should be asking yourself in the next stage that you are in your business to take your business to the next level. So just having access to that community, it's, it's a gold mine because it's kind of like having, you know, all of these different advisors to your business and they're all supporting you. And, you know, like, as I said, the impact of, of, psych, of this patriarchal judgment is it does take a toll on your mental health. It takes a, a toll on your confidence. So being in a room with ambitious women who have, you know, these amazing goals, it just, it's just a way to feed your, you know, feed your soul, feed your confidence and kind of reignite your spirit of moving forward. And, I, and I'm really grateful. I was so grateful to be a part of that community and I still have many friends that from that community that I'm, I'm grateful to have in my life now. Yeah. Oh, I love it. I love it. So um, I know that really based on this conversation, people are going to want to know, okay, how can I engage with Jackie and how can I, you know, learn more from you and where can we get people to go? So I talked about your website off the top, ask Jackie. Dot .ca <laughs> um but you've got a cool quiz that has to do with sex in the city yeah say more say more <laughs> oh yeah well it's, it's again all about making financial financial literacy fun and ladies it can be like finance can be fun i'm always looking for the fun aspect right and sex in the city complete transparency was one of my favorite shows in fact when i had my book i had a sex in the city party but i was going to say that we have a sex in the city financial quiz okay. so who are you from as a from a financial perspective what sex in the city lady are you from a financial perspective what do you need to learn about yourself financially so feel free to come check out our website there's a quiz there you can find out if you're Samantha for those of you who understand who these characters are. I know I'm dating myself for some of your audience, but you can find out if you're Samantha, if you happen to be Charlotte, um, you know, and it's just a fun way to find Look, out. If you don't know people. sex in the city, you should be ashamed of yourself. <laughs> Where is your women's history? <laughs> I'm kidding. I'm totally, totally, I'm totally kidding. <laughs> oh my oh, gosh. The only other quick tidbit I was going to add, because we spent some time talking about accountants, is I have a really great article on how to identify if your accountant is a filer or an advisor oh, and how to find the right one. So I wanted to pass site? that on. Is that on the site? So it's on the site as well. Okay. So feel free to reach out to us or, or check out our website for the article on how to find a good accountant. Listen, this is huge. One of our clients, she was scaling past a million this year. So literally more than like five X her revenue. It was amazing. And amazing. I was like, you need to get another accountant. 
you know? And she was like, the, my accountant is great. I was like, yeah. And your accountant is a filer accountant is going to really make sure that your business books and all of that, that's it's, it's in order. It's compliant that you're looking like that, looking at the business, but the advisor is about your wealth and how things need to change and how you need to read. They're different. It's just like, you wouldn't go to a, you would go to, you wouldn't go. It's like you have a podiatrist. That's right. You got an issue with your foot and you go to your GP, like they're yeah. different categories. I love that. Check out that article guys. Yeah. Beautiful. Jackie, you are just a gift. I so appreciate you coming on the show and sharing your wisdom about women building wealth. Um, and I really hope everyone who listens goes to check you out because I just love the way that you talk about women building wealth and how accessible it can be. It doesn't have to be complicated. Thank you so much. Oh, honestly, thank you for having me here. I had so much fun. 